This day after Christmas ends up being the solemnity of the Holy Family of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. God himself comes into our, a, a human family so that we can be welcomed into his family as his adopted sons, like we heard in our second reading today. The family, in some ways, is an image of God himself if the family is a communion of persons. For God, as the Blessed Trinity, is indeed that communion of persons. So in the family, if we see that communion there, and we do perhaps, but always through a veil, uh, dimly, because it's not perfect, uh, unless you have a family of saints. But we see a bit of a communion there, and that communion, that uh, love, that sacrificial love that we witness, uh, should be something that reminds us of who God is. And this is why the family is so important for us in our society and in our world, and for each one of us. Because family is um, not just training ground, but it is, in fact, the beginning of learning why we are here, learning why we exist. John Paul II called the family the cell of the civilization of love, taking a phrase from Paul VI and developing it further in his letter to families. Very beautiful thing, especially for um, married couples to read. In his letter to families, he says, the civilization of love in its current meaning is inspired by the words of the conciliar constitution from Vatican II, Gaudium et Spes. Christ Jesus fully discloses man to himself and unfolds his noble calling. And so we can say that the civilization of love originates in the revelation of the God who is love. So it is fitting for us to remember families as the civilization of love here as God reveals himself to us in this child Jesus. Here in his, revel in his revelation as part of a family, we see the beginning of the civilization of love. And yet we have, um, in a sense in our society, a kind of rebellion against the family in so many ways. In lots of small, subtle ways, the family is rebelled against. Because, oh well, some people think that the family doesn't help the individual as it should. But indeed, it does. G.K. Chesterton, I'm going to have to read a couple quotes from him as well. Not because I have some kind of quota, but I just always am thinking of things that he has said. He says in his book, Heretics, the institution of the family should be commended precisely for the same reasons that the institution of the nation or the institution of the city are commended. It's a good thing for a man to live in a family. For the same reason, it's a good thing for a man to be besieged in a city. It's a good thing for a man to live in a family in the same sense that it is a beautiful and delightful thing for him to be snowed up in a street. They all force him to realize that life is not a thing from outside, but a thing from inside. Modern writers have suggested in a more or less open manner that the family is a bad institution. They have generally confined themselves to suggesting with much sharpness, bitterness, or pathos that perhaps the family is not always very congenial. Of course the family is a good institution precisely because it is uncongenial. It is wholesome precisely because it contains so many divergencies and varieties. As the sentimentalists say, it is like a little kingdom, or like most other little kingdoms, it is also generally in a state of something resembling anarchy. Any parents with little babies know this, right? It is exactly because our brother George is not interested in our religious difficulties, but is interested in the Trocadero restaurant, that the family has some of the bracing qualities of the commonwealth. Precisely because our Uncle Harry does not approve of the theatrical ambitions of our sister Sarah, it is because of this that the family is like humanity. The men and women who, for good reasons and bad, revolt against the family are, for good reasons and bad, revolting against mankind. Aunt Elizabeth is unreasonable, just like mankind. Papa is excitable, just like mankind. Our youngest brother is mischievous, just like mankind. Grandpapa is stupid like the world. He is old like the world.
And so we see in our family the beginning of getting used to the world and all of its differences and all of its things that are uncomfortable to us. And so we can discover that if we sort of just want to run away from the family and revolt from this institution that God has uh, thrown all of us in some way into, then we aren't greater for it, we are smaller for it. Our world shrinks and loses its essential meaning, which is to be a civilization of love. We learn love, especially around those that it's not easy to love. Chesterton continues, the best way a man could test his readiness to encounter the common variety of mankind would be to climb down a chimney into any house at random and get on as well as possible with the people inside. And that is essentially what each one of us did on the day that he was born. This indeed is the sublime and special romance of the family. The family is romantic because it is a toss up. It is romantic because it is everything that its enemies call it, because it is arbitrary, because it is just simply there. So as long as you have groups of men who are chosen with some kind of plan involved, you have a sectarian atmosphere. But when you get a bunch of people chosen randomly, you have just a group of men. The element of adventure begins to exist. For an adventure is by its nature something that comes to us, a thing that chooses us, not something that we get to choose. The supreme adventure is to be born. When we step into the family by the act of being born, we step into a world which is incalculable, into a world which has its own strange laws, into a world which could do without us, into a world that we have not made. In other, worlds, in other words, when we step into the family, we step into a fairy tale. The great adventure of life, brothers and sisters, begins in our families. The great adventure of life is learning to love those imperfect people who are in your life, which is for us, first and foremost, starts with the family, but there are others, and we know as we grow older, we have other groups, uh, whether it's people that we um, are in school with, uh, on sports teams or in other groups with, our neighbors, um, our college roommates, and the list goes on and on and on as we continue to grow through, go through life. Can we love these people who are in front of us? This is why the family is so important for our society. As John Paul II continues, after affirming that man is the only creature on earth that God willed for itself, the council goes on to say that man cannot find himself except through a sincere gift of self. This appears to be a contradiction, but in fact is not. Instead, it is the magnificent paradox of human existence, an existence called to serve the truth in love. Love causes man to find fulfillment through the sincere gift of self. To love means to give and to receive something that we could, can, be, can neither be bought or sold, but only given or freely mutually, given freely and mutually, which is to give ourselves. That's the only thing that can't be bought and sold is ourselves. In our own day, history is repeating itself. We find ourselves in a type of crisis, John Paul II says, and it still exists for us. A crisis of what it means to be alive, of what it means to be human, and why we are here. We have in our society various lies about the human person. And so we have a, a lie called utilitarianism that John Paul II says, utilitarianism is a civilization of production and of use, a civilization of things and not of persons, a civilization in which persons are used in the same way things are used. In the context of this civilization of use, woman can become an object for man, children can become a hindrance to parents, the family can become an institution obstructing the freedom of its members. But indeed, this is not what we are created for. And so the lies about the human person, if you get the human person wrong, then you get the whole world wrong. 
you get all of our life wrong, and we don't understand why the family is so important. But if we start from the revelation of love that God has shown us in Christ Jesus, if we start with Mary and Joseph at the manger, then we will realize what our families are for. And we will be able to follow the advice of St. Teresa of Kolkata, as we call Mother Teresa, her advice to one who came to her, and probably many, who came to her uh, in Calcutta, hoping to serve the poorest of the poor. And she told them, go home and serve there. She said, grow where you are planted. Grow where you are planted. And that's advice for every one of us. In the families that we are planted in, in the neighborhoods that we are planted in, in the workplaces that we are planted in, can we grow there? Can we learn to love there? If you can learn to love in those uh, situations, then you can love anywhere. But if you can't love there, if you want to run away from uh, that vocation of love in those parts of your life, then your love will fall short in every other part of your life. John Paul II reminds us how important it is then for us to be people of prayer. Just as we heard in our first reading, we must put God first, as Hannah did, giving her son Samuel to the Lord in a special way dedicated to him. John Paul II says, we realize how important prayer is with and for families, in particular for those that are threatened by division, for families that are uh, attacked by these lies about why the human person exists, about what life is about and where we are headed. We need to pray that married couples will love their vocation even when the road becomes difficult or the paths become narrow, uphill, and seemingly insurpassable. We need to pray that even then they will be faithful to their covenant with God. And I would add, we must pray also that every one of us can learn to love in our families when it is not easy. That we can learn to give ourselves to those around us despite their imperfections and our disagreements. That we can learn to live what Jesus shows us in the Eucharist and in the manger. That we can give ourselves completely without counting the cost, even if it hurts us. Let us ask St. John Paul II to intercede for us as we, in our families and in other parts of our life, grow where we are planted and truly become a civilization of love once again. <laughs>